How's it guys? Welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be doing pulse ox or saturation or sat ox or go to many different countries and you'll find different names. We're going to be discussing what it is. We're going to be starting with basically like well, what are the basic fundamentals of how it works, simply what it means and we're going to be moving more into um, in-depth stuff and stay tuned because throughout this video you're probably going to learn about three things that you didn't know about pulse ox. Straight off the bat, SpO2 is a machine that looks at the percentage of saturation of oxygen in that part of the body. So that might sound pretty specific because I'm saying in that part of the body and you must also remember that it is a percentage of saturation. It's not a 100 or 500, it's 100 percent or 0 percent or 50 percent, whatever the case is. So the other reason why we say in that part of the body is because this little machine goes onto a part of the body, whether it's an ear or a nose in um, children or pediatrics, and it can go mainly on the finger in adults. The thing to note is that this tells you what's happening in that part of the body. What's happening in my finger is not necessarily what's happening in my brain. And you must also realize that the brain is actually much closer to the heart than your finger is. And so what's happening in your finger is not necessarily representative of what is happening in your brain. These are just things that you need to keep in mind. So basically what this does is it shines two lights through your blood and one light doesn't get picked up by anything and the other light gets picked up by hemoglobin that's got oxygen on it. Or later on you'll realize that it's not just oxygen, it's, it's just hemoglobin with something on it because hemoglobin can carry carbon monoxide, which is something we'll get to a bit later. But anyway, so what happens is that these lights travel through your hemoglobin, which is the cell that carries your, your oxygen normally, and the amount of light that gets absorbed by the hemoglobin is tracked, and the amount of light that then reaches the other side is then it has a calculation in terms of it works out a percentage of how much oxygen or how full is that hemoglobin. So what is normal saturation? Well, normal is between 94% and 99%. So if it's higher than 99, 100%, it means that it is far above what um, can be calculated. And so what you must also realize is that the way that they um, made this calculation is that they took healthy adults and they slowly gave them a lower percent of oxygen. So they dropped from 21 to 20 to 19 to 18. And what this did is that it allowed them to track what happened to their saturation. And so they were only able to get patients to a place where their saturation was about 90%. Because at that point, the patients felt too hypoxic because they didn't have enough oxygen in their blood to feel um, comfortable to continue with the testing. And so really, in truth, saturation is only accurate at about 90, 87% because they couldn't reliably or safely test adults at a lower level of oxygen because the patients were becoming severely lack of oxygen or severely hypoxic. Really good to know because when you see saturation of like 60% or 30%, it's, it almost means nothing because it could, it might as well be 82% or 20%. It's, it's the same thing. So there is something called a hemodissociation curve. And what this is, is it is a graph that helps us to better understand what we're seeing. And this is the graph that they used. Well, this is the graph that they made um, using the healthy adults to build the graph and the calculation that gives us that percentage that we all look at and say, oh, look, the you know, saturation is 94%. They don't need oxygen. But really, what are we looking at? So this graph that you can see here, um, it's in a S wave. And so what this means is that from 99 to 94% of oxygen saturation, we, we know where the patient's um, blood oxygen levels are is because we can see that it's quite reliable and it's quite flat. But if you see at like 93, 92, 91, how it drops off that massive curve. So the difference between 90% and 93% is much bigger than the difference between 94 and 96%. And so that's why just a little bit of uh, dropping below 94% is pretty significant where 95, 96, 97, 99%, it's not really that much more oxygen. 
The other thing to note about this graph is that it shifts to the left and it shifts to the right. So what this means is that when the graph shifts to the left, it allows oxygen to move onto hemoglobin much easier. And when it shifts to the right, it means that the oxygen leaves the hemoglobin much quicker. So you'll see if the pH is low, the oxygen leaves the hemoglobin much quicker. And if the pH is higher, the oxygen goes, goes on to the hemoglobin much quicker. So you might be like, well, why is this important? So if you have a patient who is very um, acidotic, they're in a metabolic acidosis or whatever the case is, and it, it affects how the oxygen attaches to the hemoglobin. But the other place where this is important is that in the lungs, we have a higher pH which allows hemoglobin and oxygen to bind quicker. And in the fingertips or the toes or further away from the body where we have less oxygen, there's a lower pH which allows the oxygen to then leave the hemoglobin. Very interesting. The same goes for temperature. When the temperature is higher or lower, this also affects the shifting of left and right of this. So there's a few other things that are really important to understand when it comes to saturation. And that is that there is something called O2 lag or SpO2 lag or SATS lag or whatever you want to call it. And what that means is that, like I was saying in the beginning, is that a saturation probe is attached to the finger. And the question is how long does it take oxygen from when we breathe it in to getting into our bloodstream to getting to our finger. So if the patient, for instance, let's say stops breathing now, how long does it take for the SATS probe to tell us that the oxygen saturation has actually dropped. So look at this little test I can do here. I can take a SATS probe and I put it on my finger and I hold my breath and see what happens. So did you see how when I hold my breath, the saturation doesn't change, it doesn't change. And then almost only when I start breathing in again, does it start to drop and does it start to drop? And I'm a healthy, hopefully healthy individual. So you can see how when, let's say we have someone who stops breathing and you see the saturation is 99%, you're like, well, they're, they're fine. You need to realize that whatever you're seeing on this little device or on your monitor or whatever light packs or whatever you use is that it's not a representation of what is happening now. So you need to be reminded that when you look at the monitor, that's what was in the past. And you must realize that if they are not very well perfused, if they're hypertensive, if they're very ill, um, your, your movement of blood is obviously decreased and this um, O2 sats is much longer and much slower. So you might have a two, three minute lag between uh, your O2 sats and your patient. So if you, for let's say for instance, um, you're performing an RSI, you're with a paramedic or you are a paramedic and you paralyze and you intubate and you pass the tube and you're now ventilating and you're pretty sure the tube's in and you have um, capnography on and you see your waveform that you slowly see your saturation drop and drop and drop. You can be assured that you can see uh, that your tube is in because, well, you saw it go in and you have your um, capnography in, but if your saturation just drops and drops and drops for a minute or two, you can be aware of the fact that there is SATS lag. The other thing you probably didn't know about um, SATS is that, so there is a pleth. Pleth is this wave that goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And what that does is that that, is, that shows us the pulse that is a proof of pulsation in the finger that you put the probe on so what this means is that it can tell us a lot about what the heart is actually doing so if this pleth wave is irregular the patient may actually have af something to look at it's always something to take note of is to look at the pleth is it regular is it normal 
The other thing you might not have known is that you can actually assess pulseless paradoxes with the pleth wave. So what does that mean? Well, pulseless paradoxes is seen in patients with asthma or a cardiac tamponade. And what it means is that when they breathe in, their blood pressure drops by more than 10 millimeters of mercury. But you can see this in a pleth wave of a saturation probe. It has a 88% sensitivity and an 89% specificity. So it's pretty accurate. It has to be a more than 10 uh, millimeters of mercury um, change for it to be accurate. But then that's when it's significant. And you can diagnose things like asthma. So if you put the probe on a patient and you seeing that your waves on your pleth are getting smaller when they breathe in and they get bigger when they breathe out, that is a reliable way of assessing pulses paradoxes. Hemoglobin normally carries oxygen, but saturations like these normal saturation probes that you'll see on a life pack or on these ones, they mainly can only tell you what is, well, not say what, but how much is on a hemoglobin. So it can't tell you what is on the hemoglobin. So hemoglobin can be um, filled with carbon monoxide or it can be filled with oxygen. There are some other things, but these are the main ones. And so what happens is that carbon monoxide has a 210 times affinity to attach to a hemoglobin than oxygen does, which means that if you had 210 carbon monoxide molecules and you had one oxygen molecule, the carbon monoxide or 210 would first attach to the hemoglobin and then only one oxygen would attach to the hemoglobin. So there's a massive variation. Um, carbon monoxide is from fires and from things that burn and normally something that you'll see in um, some sort of like poisoning maybe or in a house fire. So if you put your SATS probe on someone and they're looking severely short of breath and they've just come out of a house fire and your saturation says 100%, it's probably not 100% and you should probably just put oxygen on their face anyway. So I hope that was um, helpful that you learned something new, maybe the um, pulses paradoxus, uh, maybe the um, 210 times affinity to um, carbon monoxide. Who knows? Hope you enjoyed it. And um, our next video will be on ETCO2. That is another big topic. And there is plenty to get confused about there, but we'll hopefully simplify that for you. See you in the next video.